So here I am again uh, with the, yet another uh, part in my series of using the Line 6 Helix to uh, sculpt our guitar tones or shape our guitar tones or create great patches out of it. Uh, last time we talked about compressors. This time um, I had a lot of requests to cover the topic of equalizers or uh, for short EQs. Um, if anybody who did watch the compressor video will remember at the beginning um, that I kind of described a compressor as an automatic volume control. And then I also, you know, uh, qualified that by saying that that's a gross oversimplification of the term simply because there's so many parameters uh, within the compressor or within some compressors um, that allow us to tweak how that volume is going to be controlled. So. It, it kind of dumbs the the use of a compressor down so that somebody can understand what it's doing. But then we dove in quite in depth into all the other attack release and threshold and ratio parameters. Well, the reason I bring that up again is because now in talking about EQ, we can kind of come in and, and, and also describe an equalizer as just the volume control. Now, in the case of the compressor, it was an automatic volume control. It was going to react to uh, the signal that we put into it based off of how loud we're playing, uh, how short or fast we set the attack time and so on. All those variables that you can go back and watch the compressor video to find out about. Whereas an EQ is going to be more like a, a static thing. It's not going to be automatic. It's not going to change how it, uh, um, how it affects the volume uh, over time. It, we're just going to set it to how we want it to affect the volume. Well, how does an EQ work to affect the volume? Well, an EQ, in simple terms, allows us to turn the volume up and down on very specific frequencies throughout this frequency spectrum. So if we decide that we want to turn the volume up on uh, everything in the signal that's at 500 hertz, we can do so depending on the EQ we're using and if it allows us to do so. So that's basically what an EQ is. It allows us to turn the volume up or down on a specific frequency in the frequency spectrum of whatever signal we're sending into it, okay? And that's a very powerful tool. It's been a tool that's been used uh, by recording engineers, front of house mixing engineers, guitar players, pr pretty much anybody who's trying to shape a sound to either fit a mix or just to get it to uh, the tone that they're looking for, for that, that, that's pleasant to their ears, let's say, right? The problem is there's a lot of different types of EQs, and again, we run into uh, different controls on them, and to have an understanding of all those controls is gonna help us to be able to dial our EQ in a lot faster, and maybe you know a lot more accurately uh, to what our uh, desired end result is, okay? So we're gonna dive in right away here. I don't wanna go on too long about this uh, introduction to this. Um, we're gonna dive in and look at the EQs that we have uh, at our disposal uh, that's been given to us by line six in the Helix. First, a little word though about that. If we go to our amp, we're all kind of familiar with the idea of uh, equalizers on amps. You know, some EQs are very simple, one knob, maybe tone, you know. Then we get all sorts of other things where we get some amps that have cut or, uh, you know, whatever word that that amp describer decided to give to a particular EQ control. But the problem with that, and even with the problem with, uh, here I have the der derailed Ingrid up, you know, it says bass, middle, treble, presence, fine. Well, what does bass mean? What does middle mean? What does treble mean? You know, there's no defined um, frequency that's been given to treble in this case. And that could be very different for every single amp that I open up here. If I go to a plexi, maybe that treble is going to be hitting different frequencies than it is on the derailed Ingrid or the Interstate Z or the Divided Duo or whatever is in there. I, I'm not going to be really talking too much about amp um, EQ. I think most people have an idea of what they want here. And I think we all just kind of go and use our ears because there's nothing there to tell us any different. You know, We go to the bass and we say, that eh, sounds a little thin. I'd like a little more low end on that. So we dial it up until we're happy, right? Um, some amps, it just sounds great. Like I, I mentioned in a previous video, Plexi sounds great with the mids cranked up to 10. You know, that might seem like a, a crazy thing to do, but it just it's just such an integral part of the tone of that, that sort of classic Plexi tone. But do we know what frequency you're boosting? Maybe, maybe not. You know, maybe you have great ears and you can go, oh, I know what that's doing to it. But I'm gonna dive in more talking about the EQs that are provided for us with the Helix. Now, we have simple EQ, low and high cut, parametric, 10 band graphic, and Cali Q graphic, which I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is based off of the graphic EQ on a Mesa Boogie amplifier. 
Anyways, let's dive in and start by talking about low and high cut. Now, if you've noticed, I've set up, uh, like normal, an EQ test patch right here, and I've set up a bunch of snapshots. Uh, no EQ on snapshot one, simple EQ, 10 band graphic, Cal EQ, parametric, low and high cut. So we're gonna start off with just the no EQ. I've set up a, a, a basic tone here with a little bit of delay, a little bit of reverb on it, a um, couple cabs using the uh, Greenback 25 speakers with a, a 487 condenser mic and a U47 and a 160 ribbon, kind of like I always do. I have my normal kind of uh, studio comp at the end, stuff we've covered in all the other videos. And then I just set up these all these different EQs. Here I have uh, the simple EQ, 10 band graphic, Cali Q graphic, parametric, and the low and high cut. So we're gonna start here. So here's the tone that I, I used. Um, okay, so that's without any EQ, no low cuts, high cuts. Now this low cut and high cut uh, basically is going to allow us, let me just dive over and switch to that snapshot, low high, low high cut. Now that's highlighted. Um, you'll notice that I have it set 80 hertz and 10.5 kilohertz on the high cut. So what this is doing, the low and the high cut, the low cut is just basically filtering off all frequencies below whatever we set it at, okay? So everything below 80 hertz is going to be basically sloped off and cut off. Now, that sounds simple, but there is another parameter that we don't know here. We don't know how Line 6 programmed that particular low cut EQ. Is it a low cut that goes very gradual after 80 hertz? Or is it a low cut that just gets to 80 hertz and then cuts off like a cliff, right? Um, Honestly, we don't know. I guess we could pull up a spectrum analyzer to check that out. That might give us a little bit of a picture. We could just use our ears. For the most part, it's not gonna matter for our purposes playing guitar. Um, the reason, and I had this question before, because if we go up to the cab blocks, we also have low cuts and high cuts. And people say, well, why don't you just use those instead of coming over here and doing the low cut and high cut with its own block? Maybe save some DSP. What I've found by listening is that the low cut and high cuts aren't quite as dramatic on the cab block. So if I go to 10 and a half uh, kilohertz or 10,500 hertz on the cab block like so, it's not gonna be quite as dramatic there as it is by going to the low and high cut filter itself as its own block, okay? I didn't set up a snapshot for that. Maybe I should have, uh, um, maybe you can just take my word for it or try it on your own, you know, set up um, a snapshot with the, uh, say a 10,000 kilohertz cut on uh, the cabinet and then do another snapshot where that's off and you do that same cut here. And I think you'll notice that it's a little bit more dramatic on the cab block. So that's something you guys can try. But basically all this has done then is the low cut, all the frequencies below 80 Hertz are going to be cut off in some sort of dramatic fashion. And everything above 10.5 kilohertz is going to be cut off. So we're basically gonna be sitting between 80 Hertz and 10,500 Hertz is gonna be unaffected. So it's just cutting off the top, the extreme top and the extreme bottom. And some people might say, well, why do you do that? Well, uh, there's not a lot of frequency information below 80 hertz on the guitar that's gonna be of any use to us. Uh, the other thing is a lot of times if we're playing in a mix, uh, the bass guitar is going to be, and the kick drum is gonna be living down underneath six, uh, 80 hertz, sorry. Uh, and all the stuff that we're gonna be doing down there is just gonna muddy that up and get in the way. And maybe we're not gonna hear the kick drum as much. Maybe we're not gonna hear uh, the bass guitar as much. So it's just best to slice that off and get on with things, you know? You don't wanna go uh, too high on that. If you start getting up into uh, 170, 180, 100, you know, you're gonna start getting into some pretty fundamental frequencies on the guitar that you don't want to go away. So I start at 80, if some people might find that that's too high and they want 60 or 70. And again, that's just personal preference, like mo you know, all of this really comes down to. Um, on the other side of things, the guitar doesn't have a lot of information, useful information up past you know, say 10,000 hertz, maybe even lower. And I've heard some people setting this as low as six and 7,000. Now, what happens is your sound gets much duller, right? Uh, so I've, I've started off at 10 and a half. Some people are gonna go higher, some people are gonna go lower, some people aren't gonna use this at all. And that's all perfectly fine. In the end, if we're hearing what we wanna hear, then that's gonna be good. So um, here is the sound with the low and high cut engaged.
Now let me switch between no EQ and the low high cut. Here's no EQ. And again, if you remember in the previous videos, up here you'll see the snapshot that I'm on. Always up here you can watch when I switch over between them, okay? So here's no EQ. <laughs> back and forth a bit. You probably heard that when I switched. It it took a little bit of that abrasive high end off and just controlled the sound a little bit more, made it a little more focused to where we want to hear it. So we'll try that again. Here's the no EQ. <laughs> Okay, so I, that already, just by adding that in, to me improves the sound a, a lot. So that's something I put on probably all of my patches, a low and high cut, and I always put it before my compressor at the end, so that those low frequencies that I'm dialing out aren't gonna trigger the compressor, right? Or the high frequencies, but the low frequencies will really trigger that compressor. So they're just out of the way, the compressor's gonna work just on the signal that I'm giving it. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that on for all the rest of the examples now. Uh, so the low and high cut will always be on, even when I uh, go through, obviously it's not on, not on the no EQ setting, obviously, but on the simple EQ, you can kind of see it's there. 10 band graphic, I kept it on. Cal EQ, I kept it on. Parametric, I kept it on and so forth, okay? So that's what the uh, low and high cut block do. Now, <clears throat> um, uh, another question I get a lot of times, why do I have the EQs after my delay and reverb? That's just a personal preference thing. I think later on, I did set up a snapshot here that compares the difference between going with them before or after the effects, just so that we can kind of get rid of that argument. And it's not as dramatic a thing as some people think it is. It would be if you had very dramatic delay, very dramatic reverb, it could make a bigger difference. I tend not to be huge on the reverb, huge on the delay, just subtle things. And I like the EQ and the compressor at the end of the chain to kind of make it a more cohesive glued together sound. So that's, again, and you know, it's as simple as just moving these around uh, to how we would prefer it, right? Okay, so let's move on to the simple EQ. All right. Actually, you know what, let's do this instead. Let's go through and look at the controls on each EQ that we have and talk about the actual param what the parameters are going to do on each of these. So the simple EQ has low gain, mid frequency, mid gain, high gain, and level. The 10 band graphic just has a bunch of sliders with frequencies beside them, 10 frequencies to be exact. Well, guess what the Cal EQ is gonna have? Well, it is a five band graphic EQ, so it's gonna have different frequencies with sliders that we can adjust. And then we have a parametric EQ, and this is where it gets really interesting. Well, let's talk about what a parametric EQ does, because that's gonna also give us a little bit more info as to what a graphic EQ does as well. So if you notice, we basically have a three band graphic EQ with low cut and high cut filters. I haven't tried these low cuts and high cuts on the parametric to be completely honest with you. I haven't listened to see if they basically do the same thing as the low and the high cut uh, block on its own. Uh, if they do, then it would make this kind of pointless. We could just come in here and say, hey, let's use the low cut and high cut in here and save some DSP. Uh, maybe you guys want to experiment with that. I, I probably will at some other point. I probably should have before I made this video, but I, I didn't really get around to uh, to looking into that. So um, yeah, it might might just be an easier way and save ourselves a, a block and some DSP possibly. But let's we won't deal with the low and high cut. We've already talked about what that does, so you can implement it here as well, right? And it's just as simple as coming in and you know doing an 80 hertz here, whatever we want on the high end. But we do have what we call a three band parametric EQ. Each band, low frequency, low Q, low gain. So that's telling us that these are going to affect the low frequencies of the spectrum. And the range here, I have it set at 240, goes all the way down to 20 hertz and all the way up to 495 hertz. So I'll put it back to 240 where I had it. Then in the mid frequency, we can adjust the mid frequency, which goes, I have it set at 500. It goes from 125 all the way up to 8,000 hertz. Set it back to 500. And then the high frequency, which I have at 8,000, goes all the way down to 500 and all the way up to 18,000 hertz. 
uh, can't remember where I had that. Let me just go out of that and back into it. Oh, okay, I added 5.6. Okay, now that's the, the frequency. A lot of people say, well, what is the frequency, right? Um, 240 hertz, what does that mean? Well, that's all going to um, refer to a specific frequency in the frequency spectrum, right? We've heard bit, bass, middle, treble, and all of these terms. Well, bass is going to be the lower sounds, right? Anything, you know, up to maybe 200 hertz, 150, 160 hertz and below. Then you get the sub bass, which is like 20, 30, 40 hertz, almost sub audible. We almost feel those frequencies more than we hear them, right? Um, the mid frequencies are going to be, you know, in that 200, maybe up to a thousand, 2000, right? Those would be like kind of maybe our low mids. Then we can get into higher mids, which are going to be up maybe 2,000 to 6,000 range. And then the highs are, you know, anything above that, maybe 8,000 to, to 20,000. And, you know, even beyond, you have some EQs that allow you to tweak even beyond what humans can hear. Now, the, the funny thing about this, this actually applies to guitar notes as well, right? Um, if I go on the guitar and play an open A string, well, there is a frequency to that string, right? That is 110 hertz. If I move up an octave from that to the second fret on the third string, that would be 220 hertz. So I've got 110 hertz, 220 hertz. If I move up another octave, now I'm at 440 hertz. There's that typical concert tone, A440 we all hear about. Well, what does A440 mean? Well, it means that everybody's tuning to the note A at 440 hertz. Right, so that's the tuning fork. We, we we hit that. That's the tone that we're hearing. Right, so A A A, 110 hertz, 220 hertz, 440 hertz. If you've noticed, they just keep doubling. 110 multiplied by 2, 220 multiplied by 2, 440. Right. Anyone want to take a guess at what the next one's going to be? Right, it's going to be 880, and on and on on from there. Um, so. Moving up another octave to another A is going to get us up to there. So those frequencies do correspond to notes. Now, we're not necessarily thinking of that. We're not going, well, I'm playing a lot of A's, therefore I'm going to go and boost 110 hertz. But if I did go and dramatically cut that frequency, let's say I go into an EQ and I go to 110 hertz and yank that way down, when I do come around to that note, you're probably gonna notice it get affected more so than anything, because that's its fundamental frequency. I just find thinking of frequencies in terms of guitar notes helps us to kind of understand where they lie in the frequency spectrum, right? Okay, so we kind of understand what frequency is. Now, uh, the gain of that note, that's pretty simple. That's where that volume control comes into the picture that I was talking about before. How high, or how, you know, how high do we want the volume of that particular frequency to be or how low do we want it to be? If you notice here, I have 240 hertz and I've bumped it up 1.2 dB. Just a subtle, subtle bump, you know, and, and again, it's going to be in and around this note here, right? A uh, little bit higher than that, <clears throat> if just for reference of the, of the tonality of it. Okay, but we're missing one very important thing, and this is the one, this is the parameter that usually gets everybody. Low Q, or in, in just let's call it Q, because it's it's the Q for the low frequencies. And this is, this is short for bandwidth, okay? Um, the bandwidth of the note is how wide is that frequency boost or cut going to be? And this is a part that confuses a lot of people because they don't really understand what they may be doing with it. I have this set at 1.4 and for kind of a specific reason. I think the default setting most of the time when you pull up the parametric EQ is 0.7. And there's a reason for that as well. That's referring to how many octaves are going to be involved in the boost or cut that we're going to do, okay? So if I'm, let me just pull this back to 220 up here. So that note is A. That's a Sorry, that's, that's not A, this is A. Now again, we're not dealing with notes here. We're dealing with frequencies uh, in the frequency spectrum as far as boosting or cutting them within a, a guitar track that's gonna contain more than just the note A. So it's, it's not accurate to say, hey, we're boosting and cutting A, right? It's affecting all sorts of frequencies. But now if I go to a Q of 0.7, what that means is that that is going to affect frequencies over a two octave bandwidth. So two octaves on either side of this center point, 
okay? So it's going to go all the way up very wide and boost 1.2 dB at this frequency, but it's also going to boost to a lesser degree all the way up two more octaves, roughly, roughly two more octaves. I don't know, you know, whoever designs each particular EQ can play with that a bit. So it's this is not exact numbers, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. It's more just to get a, a general understanding of what we're doing. So we're going to have basically think of like a bell shape, right? It comes up and let's say the top of the bell right in the center is 220 hertz, okay? Well, it's not just going straight up and affecting only that 220 hertz. It's actually gonna be 1.2 dB as I have it set, higher here, and it's gonna gradually slope down. Well, is it gonna slope down like this? Or is it gonna slope down like this? Or is it gonna slope down like this? Well, that's what the Q is going to affect, right? So if I go 0.7, it's gonna go out two octaves either side of it. So it's gonna go not only up to 440, which would be one octave, but all the way up to 880 Hertz. So at set at 0.7, this is going to affect everything from 220 Hertz all the way up to 880 Hertz on this side. Right? On the other side, if we go down one octave, we go down to 110. Well, this is gonna actually get all the way down to 55. So everything from 55 Hertz all the way up to 880 Hertz. That's a pretty wide hue. I don't want to boost all the way down to 55 Hertz. I've already been trying to cut that out, if you remember, with my low cut. So what I did is I said, well, I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna move this to 1.4. Now that's dealing with one octave on either side of it, right? So now I'm boosting, by, by boosting the 220, 1.2 dB, I'm also in a lesser way affecting frequencies all the way down to roughly 110 and all the way up to 440. So that gives us a better understanding of what that particular control is doing now. So I'm giving it a little boost, right? Over all of those frequencies. So if we apply the same thing to the mid frequencies, I have it set at 500. I have a Q again of 1.4, so one octave on either side, and I've cut it by 3.4 dB. So that's meaning I'm gonna have everything cut all the way down the frequencies affected into the 250 range and all the way up to 1,000. So we just multiply by two or divide by two, right? 500 divided by two, 250, that's one octave lower. So that's roughly what I'm affecting. So I'm scooping out everything, not everything, sorry, by 3.4 dB at the 500 hertz center point and to a lesser amount all the way down to 250 hertz. And I'm also scooping a little bit all the way down up into the thousand hertz. You might say, well, that's gonna maybe, you know, cut it a little bit of something we want. Well, and then you can, you know, you can just basically bump this up and make it even narrower. We can go all the way up to 10, a Q setting of 10, which is gonna make a very, we're, we're basically gonna hone right into 500 hertz and just uh, pinpoint almost just that frequency and very few surrounding, um, frequencies. But I, I, I chose, I don't really like the sound of very sharp cues like that, um, unless it's to fix a problem. Maybe we have something to go, wow, that is one frequency really poking out there and we want to tame that without affecting anything else and we might use it. But for, for sculpting guitar tones, I want to be a little bit more broad about it. So we have like more broad cuts and, and peaks, right? And the same thing up here, 5.6 kilohertz, I went down to 0.7. So I'm actually extending way up into the upper range and a little more down to, to get back maybe some of what we pulled out of um, the mid frequencies, okay? So very powerful feature and it's the one that most people shy away from and it's probably the most powerful thing about a parametric EQ, okay? Maybe that's why a lot of people don't use parametric EQs or don't get the desired results they want from it because they're afraid of that parameter and they just don't touch it. They don't really know what it's doing, right? Kind of like some of the parameters we spoke about on compressors. Okay, so I hope that clears up the parametric EQ. I'm not gonna really do much playing yet until we wanna go through all the um, variables we wanna talk about. And then I'll compare these with some snapshots that I have set up. So if I come now over to the simple EQ, let's go back to that. So here's the simple EQ. Well, let's look at what controls it has. It has low gain, mid frequency, mid gain, and it has high gain. There's no bandwidth at all. There's no Q factors here at all. So we don't have any control over how wide the bandwidth of, this, of these frequencies are. They're set, okay? Kind of like when we talked about the compressors, right? Some of the compressors just have one knob or two knobs and we don't really know what they do. We just have to go by ear and, and kind of hopefully, you know, tune them into something or have the ability to tune them in to something that we want even though the tweakability is limited, right? if tweakability is a word. Um, so low gain, again, it doesn't give us frequency here. 
So, you know, that's simple EQ, right? It's keeping it really simple. It's not bogging things down with all this info that maybe a lot of people just don't want. I want a little more low end, so they bump up the low gain. I want a little bit more high gain, they bump up the high gain, but we don't really know exactly uh, what it's affecting, which frequency it's affecting. Although the mid frequency they have uh, allowed us to dial in ourselves and we can go, I have it set at 450, we can go anywhere from 125 all the way up to four kilohertz. Um, me and my short memory, I think I said I had it set at 450. Okay, and I, you know, and then we can, once we've picked that frequency, we can come in and dial it up or down however many decibels we want uh, within whatever the range is on this. So that's a simple EQ. Um, a little more fly by the seat of your pants use here because we don't know what frequencies we're, we're affecting, but can be very useful. Maybe it's just what we want, something simple. We, we bump some, one of the, you know, the low gain up and we go, perfect, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. And off we go. You know, it sounds, if it sounds good, it is good. So bottom line is how we got there doesn't really matter at that point. But one thing I do like to do though, in this case is if you remember in the compressor uh, video and some of the other videos, I like to just take parameters and go to their absolute extremes to hear, well, what is this doing? You know, and that's something we'll do, maybe not with this EQ, uh, but with the uh, graphic EQ. Okay, so let's move on to the graphic EQ. Um, We'll start with the Cal EQ. That is going to be a five band graphic EQ. Now what a five band means is it's only going to give us five particular frequencies we can work with. There's no bandwidth control. There's no choice of frequencies. This is giving us the ability to tweak 80 Hertz, 240 Hertz, 750 Hertz, 2200 Hertz, and 6600 Hertz. And if you don't like that, then don't use a CQ because that's what it is, right? Do we know what the Q width or the bandwidth of these frequencies are? Nope unless we just listen, you know, and use our ears. I guess we could pull out a, a frequency a spectrum analyzer and, and look, and even that's hard to read because you go, oh, depending on the chord I'm playing, what frequency is it showing me? And anyways, you could do it and get an idea of what's going on. Do we really care that much? I, I, in this case, I'm gonna bump and cut things, boost things until I, I find something that I like the sound of, and that's that, right? So um, it gives us those particular frequencies. Uh, the bandwidth is going to be set basically just by whoever designed this EQ. And you might tend to think that, well, this is gonna cover everything from 750 to 240 and 750 up to 2200. Maybe, I, I don't know. You know, uh, Maybe they designed it to be much narrower than that. So it's not gonna be as simple as just saying, uh, I'll boost this up and it'll take care of all those frequencies. We have to listen and, and determine what it is doing. And that's why somebody might say, well, why do we have, you know, Cali Q graphic and 10 man, why did they go to a Mesa amp and, and try to model what that graph Q is? Well, maybe Mesa spent a long time fine tuning the bandwidths on, on their uh, frequencies that they chose. Maybe they chose those frequencies for a very particular reason. And maybe that graphic EQ just has a really nice ability to dial in guitar tone. Line six was awesome to, to grab that and to model it so that we now can throw that on any amp, not just a, a boogie amp or, or you know, that it, that it comes with in, in the real world, right? In our virtual world, we can match all this stuff up with anything we want. So that's a pretty cool feature. Um, if we jump over to the 10 band graphic, not much else to say here, other than we now have 10 frequencies that I think this is just a line six original. So they chose 31.25 Hertz, 62.5 Hertz, 125, 250, 500, 1248. If you notice, kind of interesting, you go, well, why did they choose 31.25? Well, because that's exactly half of 62.5, which is exactly half of 125. They've moved up in octaves, right? So this is single octave bands. And I'm guessing this is 125 Hertz is probably gonna affect the frequencies uh, a bandwidth of an octave on either side, like we talked about. So that would be a, a, a Q setting on a parametric EQ of 1.4, right? And I'm guessing that that's what they've worked into this. So this is gonna take care of everything down to there, or, or maybe, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's going to only take care of half of that, a setting of 2.8, actually, that might make even more sense because if we boost 62.5 Hertz, it's gonna go up half an octave, and then the 125 could go down a half an octave and meet in the middle, right? Who knows? Uh, again, doesn't really matter. Let's use our ears on this and see what we can dial in, right? Um, and then one thing I didn't mention the other, we do have an overall level control. Sometimes what happens when we boost a whole bunch of frequencies, uh, the overall volume level of our patch goes up. So we might wanna come down here and say, oh, that went up by a dB or two. So I could just roll this down down here and say, okay, got rid of that dB and it's, I'm back to my original volume of my patch. This is an important thing. We maybe are peaking something out or just louder than our other patches now. So we can control the overall level 
uh, that we maybe boosted or cut. If we cut frequencies, then we can come in and, and boost them up, you know? Okay, so that's uh, that basically covers those. Uh, we talked about simple EQ to, okay, so we've covered all the EQs, right? So let's take a look now. What I did is I started with um, the simple EQ. And I just said, well, that's the least flexible of all of these, really. Uh, and I dialed in probably, I, I didn't want to go too extreme, but I had to go extreme enough that you're gonna actually hear a difference between that sound. That's another thing on these videos. If you listen on a good set of headphones or on your studio monitors in a decent listening environment, you're, some of the, the changes, even with the compressors and whatnot, there's some subtle changes sometimes, right? So if you're listening on a, a phone or a really awful set of earbuds, you may not pick up a low frequency change or a high frequency change or just whatever, right? So you, you might wanna just listen on, I'm listening on, um, uh, Sennheiser HD 600s, great sort of industry standard uh, among mastering engineers. Amazing sounding set of headphones. A little bit pricey, but but really really good headphones, and the Helix sounds great through them. And you can hear those fine changes uh, on them. So I use this just because I said, okay, let's dial in a simple little boost in the low end. The reason I chose 450 hertz is just more or less because that's sometimes where a little bit of the mud lives. I find when you cut a little bit at 450 hertz. 400, between 400 and 500 hertz, gently. Um, it just gives us a little more clarity. Instead of going up to the high end and boosting, we can cut in the low mids and we get to kind of the same sort of effect without maybe getting that abrasive edginess to boosting high frequencies that maybe will take in some of the frequencies that we don't want to boost, right? So I found that that's a very powerful tool. Maybe point minus, sorry, minus three dB might be a little much, but I'm trying to dial in something that you're gonna hear on, on your headphones or speakers, right? And then the high gain, I just bump up that. So th this is kind of, by, sorry, by one dB, this is kind of almost like this smiley face, uh, if you've ever heard of that term, where we scoop the mids out a bit, right? There's a reason why a lot of people use that because it, it gives us a, a particular sound. A little bit heavier on the low end, little gentle scoop in the mids. It's not the dramatic kind of uh, heavy metal uh, uh, scoop all your mids out uh, tone, right? It's much more gentle than that. Y you don't want to pull too much of that low mid out because otherwise it's, it's, it's going to hollow your sound. It's not going to sound nice. It's not going to cut either. So, um, And then a little bit of a boost in the high end. So let's just play. I'm just going to play something really simple and uh, go between no EQ and the uh, simple EQ. So here's the no EQ. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I'm not going to go between no EQ because that doesn't have the low and high cut uh, filters that I put on before. So I'll go between my low and high cut uh, uh, snapshot and then go to simple EQ. Listen for just a little more, um, less mud and a little more brilliance in the high end. Not to a degree where it's going to get harsh, but just sparkly, right? So if you, if you listen to the no EQ... <laughs> And then the low and high cuts, you'll hear how some of the sparkle in the high end goes away. Somebody might say, oh, I kind of lost a little bit of that edge. Yeah, but we can now get that back in with our simple EQ. So here's the low and high cut, and then I'll go to the simple EQ. I hope everybody could hear that. It just kind of came to life. It sounded like more like a, a mastered signal now, you know, something, a record that was just gone to the mastering engineer and came back and sounds more polished, right? It's not dramatic. It might even be a little more scooped in the mids than I would like, as I mentioned, just because I'm trying to make sure that you can hear the difference. So again, low, high, I'll go back to the, just the low and high cut with no other EQ. Quite a powerful little tool, a simple, literally a simple EQ, right? A little boost in the high end, a little bit of pulling out some mud, and a little tiny uh, boost in the top end, and it really brings our sound to life. We don't have to be heavy-handed. We don't have to use a sledgehammer on tones all the time, so we can do subtle moves. And two or three subtle moves, maybe a little boost here and a little cut, 
in another frequency is all we needed to just add some sparkle to it. So what I did then is I, after on my other patches, I just tried my best, even though the tool is gonna be very different, I don't know what frequencies this is boosting and cutting at, right? Except for the mid frequency. So if I come into my 10 band graphic EQ now, I don't know really where to go boost. What I did is I tried to sort of replicate it, but it's gonna be almost impossible because they're gonna be different bandwidths. It's gonna be different frequencies I have control over. So it's gonna allow me to shape the sound different. I did come in and, and cut down the 500 Hertz, uh, slight boost in the lo lows to low, low mids, right? By 0.5 dB each, um, four kilohertz up by plus 0.7. If you notice, I even went up to 16 kilohertz just to give it a little sparkle back in the hand. But again, 1 dB, 1.6. I've never really done any boosts past, you know, like one and a half ish, right? And there's 1.6. So, you know, I'll bump that back there. So I'm not a liar. Um, so let's listen to that. See what that sounds like. Same sort of an effect, right? So let's switch between that and the simple EQ as I play. Okay, so watch up here on our snapshots and you'll hear where I'm going back and forth and see if it's close. It's probably not gonna be exact, it's a different tool, right? So here's the uh, simple EQ. What did you hear? I don't know. I mean, very subtle changes, right? But if we go and compare either of those now to just the low and high cut with no other EQ, we'll hear that difference again. Here's low and high cut only. Did you hear the difference? Yeah, big difference going from no EQ or just a low and high cut to adding that graphic EQ in. Okay, now let's go and compare it to the Cal EQ, which is going to be, like we said, less frequency bands altogether, so less ability to shape the sound. Uh, 80 hertz, 240, 750. So what I did is I boosted up 1 dB at 240, pulled out a little 750 to kind of replicate uh, the 500 I did here, but I didn't want to go as dramatic because I didn't want to maybe uh, maybe I'll just go a little bit more, uh, minus two. Little boost in the uh, mids and upper mids to highs. It's all I could do with this because that's all the, the tool allows me to get. But uh, let's take a listen to uh, that sound. <laughs> Okay, same sort of thing. We hear it's a little bit uh, brightened up. Let's go between that and the, just the low high cut. See the difference? Again, similar effect. It you know brightens it up, scoops a little bit of the low mids out, cleans it up, gets rid of some of the mud, right? Uh, let's switch between all of those. I'll start again with our low high cut and then go between simple 10 band and the Cali Q, okay? Here's the uh, low high cut.
subtle differences between all of them, but all of them are very usable and all of them are giving me the same general effect. But it's nice to have the different tools to be able to come in and mess around with, right? And then finally, uh, let's look at the parametric. Okay, so that's going to be where, uh, there it is. So what I did with this one, now I have ultimate flexibility, right? So compared to the simple EQ where I boosted 1.5 dB at some unknown low frequency, uh, cut 3 dB at 450 and boosted 1 dB, uh, at some unknown high frequency. I kind of tried to mimic that. The high frequency I went up to uh, 5.6 kilohertz with a 0.7 fairly wide bandwidth. So it's gonna take a, a real broad kind of mid range and highs and boosted it up 2 dB, fairly aggressive. I went to 500 hertz uh, at a 1.4. So one octave on either side, all the way up to a thousand hertz and down to 250 and I cut that 3.4 dB. And 220, I went in again with the uh, Q of 1.4 and boosted at 1.2. So let's go between that and just the high and low cut filters again. So here's the high and low cut. We're starting to see how powerful that EQ, any of these EQs can be. I, I really always kind of go to the parametric because again, it's like the uh, deluxe compressor. It gives me maximum tweakability over all of my parameters. Once you understand that, you say, oh, great, let's go. I know what to do with these. I know what Q means. I know what all these things do. And now I can shape my sound. I don't need to just go to a graphic EQ and rely, or a simple EQ and rely on what the uh, manufacturer or the person who made it told me is a good frequency. I can choose. You know, so um, I think that shows that some pretty subtle moves can make a big difference, right? So I've set up another patch here, which is I just called EQ typical. Um, and the reason I did that is just because I wanted to um, set the EQ how I would tend to maybe dial it in, right? I have a 10 and a half kilohertz uh, high cut and an 80. Uh, hertz low cut just like before if you notice what I did is I dialed my amp tone in but like we said before right that amp tone sounds fine once we add the low and the high cut in see it has a, that little bit of that high end with it off I add that in it softens the amp tone up a bit. Some of the high end's gone, maybe some of the sparkle is gone. But then I can come back in and turn on, which patch is it here, Simple EQ. Yeah, I think that's the one that, uh, I forgot to rename that, sorry about that, but uh, tip, uh, okay, yeah. So I came into 180 hertz, a little bit lower, uh, around a one octave Q, right, 1.2 roughly, just Bumped that up 1 dB. I went into that 400 hertz and I went a little more broad on the width of, uh, a little wider on the width and I just brought it down 1.6 dB. If you notice the other times I was going down 3 dB, 4 dB, right? I don't want to be that dramatic and heavy handed about it. And then I came up to my high Q in the 4.7 kilohertz, so high mids and about a little more than a two octave Q. Um, and I bumped that up 2.5. So let's hear the effect that going between no EQ and uh, that typical EQ that I would use is. So uh, let's go no EQ, here it is.
kind of brings it to life, but it's not, it's not dramatic in any sense, but it just helps that sound to cut. I could put that EQ on, go at stage volume or crank that up. I'm not going to get that abrasiveness. I've cut a lot of those abrasive frequencies out with my, my low and high cut filters. And I've added a little more sparkling and got rid of a little bit of the muddy frequencies in the 400. Just a touch, right? Just a dB and a half or so. And that's really going to bring the sound to life quite a bit. Okay, so what I did too is I set up another couple post EQ, where uh, post effects, sorry, where the EQs are after the effects. And then pre EQ, where the same settings on my EQ are before the effects. Because a lot of people say, well, oh, effects shouldn't be after, or sorry, the EQ shouldn't be after the effects. Some people say, oh, it should be before. Okay, let's listen. I'm gonna play a little bit through both post and pre. So here it is with the way I would normally set it, uh, where the EQ is after the effects. <laughs> You make up your mind. It's a very subtle difference, uh, you know, whether we put it before or after. In this setting, like I said, if there was a very dramatic delay or reverb on my sound, like very noticeable, very uh, out front, then yeah, fine, you might notice a difference. In, but it's so simple, right? I mean, we can just grab a block and drag it, you know? Okay, done, right? It's that, that simple if that's what we want to do. Um, okay, the other thing that I, I would like to cover is, a lot of people will then ask, well, how do I know what frequencies I should go and boost or cut or, you know, um, you know, what's going to work, what's not going to work, right? So um, one thing that we can do is just take our EQ here. I'm just using the uh, Cal EQ. Center it all off back to zero. Okay, so I can come in here, uh, low cut, high cut, shut that off altogether. And like I said before in, in one of the other videos, I said, if I don't really understand what a parameter does, I'm gonna just crank it up to its extremes and hear what kind of an effect it has, right? Uh, and, and then that is a really quick way to educate myself as to whether that's something I wanna use or I don't wanna use. So let's take 80 Hertz and we're just gonna crank it all the way up to the max, plus 13.2, right? So let's hear what that does. I'll just play some simple stuff. <laughs> versus set at zero. Versus cut, 13. So we can all pretty clearly hear what that does. All of our low end either comes in or goes away. Uh, even boosted surprisingly at plus 13 dB, it just gives a beautiful fatness to the sound. Obviously way too much and that's going to get in the way of very likely our kick drum and our bass guitar and everything else. But we could come in and just give it a subtle boost, right? Uh, 240 hertz without plus 13 dB. Take it all the way down. You can hear there, it's really hollowed the sound out, right? Uh, 750 without. Full. Kind of nasally, right? Pull it all the way out. Now we're starting to get that kind of scooped heavy metal tone a little bit. Uh, 2200. All the way up to plus 9.6. Pull 
that all the way out. You can hear you lose a lot of some very important frequencies on the guitar. 6,600, boost it all the way up. Pretty annoying hearing all that fizziness up, up there. Pull it way out. Darkens it up a lot, right? So you could say, well, what if I was to come in and boost say 3 dB at 80. Versus cutting a few dB at 6600. Not necessarily that that's going to be the perfect example of that, but a lot of times we can kind of accomplish the same thing by cutting kind of a complementary frequency, right? Instead of boosting the lows, we can cut the highs. Or instead of uh, boosting the highs, we can cut the low mids, right? And get the same effect without maybe adding some artifacts by just boosting up high end all the way, you know what I mean? All right, well guys, that's another long video. Uh, I hope that helped some folks. Again, it, it maybe just raised more questions. I hope I, I, I explained things clearly. Um, if you do have any questions, please leave the comments uh, below. I'm happy to answer them, uh, you know, as soon as I, I can get around to them. Um, I And again, like I said, I hope that helped somebody um, in their endeavor to kind of incorporate EQs. I think we can see how powerful it can be. You know, one thing you can do is dial in your amp sound with your EQ settings to where you want it uh, so that the tonality is there, that you, the, the amount of overdrive and distortion, everything's just right. And then you can kind of say, okay, I'm not going to play with that anymore. I'm going to put an particular EQ in and now that I understand what these parameters do I'm going to play with those to kind of add a sparkle to it and that goes back to that original video I did part one which was talking about kind of having the mastering section down here once we've dialed in that sound we got everything working put your compressor at the end put an EQ and take care of all that stuff and, and just polish the entire sound right and make it a little more of a cohesive glued together unit that might work better for us so Anyway, guys, I hope that helped. Uh, please hit the subscribe button if you're enjoying what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to be working on all sorts of different things, going to get some guitar lesson style videos as well that I think can help a lot of folks with some uh, lead and rhythm plan. And uh, please share the video, like it, you know, all of those typical YouTube things. Uh, I really appreciate the kind comments I've been getting and the support from everybody, and I really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm really glad I can hopefully help some folks. You know, some people probably already know this stuff and don't have to listen to me go on and on for, what is it, 50 some odd minutes now. Um, but anyways, uh, thanks again for tuning in, guys. Uh, leave me your questions and comments, and uh, we'll see you again real soon.